Man, how time flies. It's already been a year since I got to announce back in December 1st, 2021, in disbelief and elation that I'd be playing the main villain of the new JoJo season, JoJo Part 6 on Ocean. I played Father Enrico Pucci, and it's been just a dream journey for me. Now, before I dive further into the video, I am going to go into spoilers in this one, so be sure to watch Stone Ocean if you care about spoilers before you come to this video, just putting that out there. But ever since Batch 3 came out, the final batch of episodes, the finale to Stone Ocean, and the finale to this era of JoJo, if you will, this universe of JoJo, the feedback that I've been receiving has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, I've just been overwhelmed by the amount of enthusiasm that people have shown towards my performance. You know, when I first got this role, I understood the responsibility of bringing this character to life because of how seminal he is. You know, he's the guy who resets the JoJo universe. He is the guy who kills, party wipes the main cast. Though, of course, at the end, he does face swift justice and uh, the cast does return in their sort of alternate forms. But, you know, this is an incredibly formidable villain who had to convey many different things to really do how the character was portrayed in the manga, Justice, and so I really gave it my all, especially with this third batch where the villain really goes full villain mode. One of the important things for me with this character was to see that performance evolve because he starts out really calm and collected and very calculating in the first batch, and then that sort of slowly evolves into someone who becomes more deranged, right? Just more sort of delusional and someone who becomes more sort of almost like televangelist levels of like this is the path towards paradise, towards heaven. And then by the end, you see him desperate and pleading for his life and almost like pitiful. And, you know, it was important to see that evolution in the character through the performance. So I hope I was able to convey that. And just a lot of people were really happy with uh, just the performance of the third batch. And uh, I, I'm glad that I was able to give it my all. And you know, I'm glad that many people were so pleased by how that turned out. Uh, you know, I, I, as an actor, especially playing some of these seminal characters, you know, you worry that maybe, oh my God, what if I don't do this character justice? But uh, you guys have been incredibly enthusiastic and your cheers and support uh, really has meant a lot. So... First of all, I want to say thank you. Now, something I want to do is interact with the fans and just talk about JoJo and this character. So I'll be hosting a signing live stream tomorrow on December 18th, 2022 at 2 p.m. Pacific. And if you're so inclined, you can visit my Streamly page, streamly.com slash yeah, and you're able to buy some of these prints if you're interested in me sending you a signed print with a message on it or whatever you want. I'll be signing these and shouting out people who purchase prints and also just like trying to answer as many questions as possible in the chat or just interact with people in the chat as much as I can. It should be a good time for those who just want to interact with me directly and talk all things JoJo and Poochie. Now, I figured it might be kind of fun to show you guys a little behind-the-scenes footage. I filmed myself recording for Poochie's final moments, his death scene, essentially, initially just to essentially preserve the memory, but then I figured, why not just kind of see how my footage of me recording during the session aligns with how the final scene turned out. I just thought it'd be kind of fun. Um, so this is my TikTok page where I uploaded this short. I'm not a TikToker, by the way, but every once in a while I might upload a, a short clip of something. Figured why not upload it to TikTok as well. But here's the clip in question for those wondering what that looks like. Go to hell, you insignificant little brat! Ah! 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 You can see right there, I'm just like, oh god, because my head was. I just got like really dizzy all of a sudden. I was like, oh my god, whoa, I need, I need like a sip of water. Uh, but that was so much fun. Fortunately, I got that in one take, and I didn't have to do it a second time. Uh, usually, you know, you have to match the timing of the lip flaps or the timing of the Japanese audio. And if there's a technical reason for why you can't use that one take, you got to do it again. And there were a couple screams where I had to do multiple times, which was not ideal. But you know, I still gave it my all, and it was still a lot of fun to do. But uh, yeah, I was. I'm. I'm. I'm just glad that people resonated with Pucci's 
final moments and all the epic events leading up to it. The third batch really was the most fun I had with a villain because this is when the villain's plans really come to fruition. This is when he really kind of goes all out. He feels the power of God and anime inside him, right? And so I got to give very villainous speeches and really go full JoJo with it. I got to say iconic lines like Made in Heaven. There's a YouTube clip somebody uploaded. The true purpose of this ability is to guide the masses of humanity towards everlasting happiness. Allow me to introduce you to my new stand, my gift to humanity. I shall christen my stand. Made in Heaven! I've been waiting a year to say that line, and gotta say, I got some chills when I finally got to shout the name of the stand, the oh-so-iconic name that uh, causes the resetting of the universe. One of the really cool things is that I, I think I got a lot of room to play because I portrayed so many different characters. I portrayed, obviously, older Poochie, but also younger Poochie. I portrayed the stand, White Snake. I portrayed Sea Moon, as well as some small little tidbits like uh, one Tom Cruise. For what reason did fate choose to take my brother's life and not mine? And why do humans experience happiness and misfortune? Hey, McQueen. You are truly evil and a misanthrope, aren't you? You sentient bag of plankton! You're explaining things to me with unearned triumph and arrogance? How dare you! I've come to eliminate you for good, since you couldn't wait two more days. <laughs> Jolene Kujo! <laughs> Those titties are suspicious. What the hell? Man, again, just such a blast. Uh, I guess I'll give you a little insight into some of the inspirations I took to shape this character. To get to that very villainy mode, I wanted to give him sort of a very theatrical way of speaking. You know, this is how I normally talk, but Enrico Pucci, you know, the way he speaks, you know, it's a very formal, but also very eloquent and also very musical. A little kind of like Darth Vader-esque, you know, when he goes, you don't know the power of the dark side. It's like that very theatrical way of performing because he is a priest and, you know, he's someone who is really good at speaking publicly, obviously, and really good at convincing and really good at uh, just preaching his gospel, if you will. But obviously, on top of that, the character needed that layer of menace. And for that, I really, I think, took inspiration from Hugo Weaving, uh, Agent Smith specifically. He also has a very theatrical way of expressing menace. And there's one line when I am facing off against Emporio, who kills my character, when I go, uh, Prepare yourself to die. That's why I elected to stop the passing of time at the moment you were most vulnerable. Now prepare yourself to die. Only by accepting your death can you be happy, Emporio. I remember channeling my inner Hugo Weaving when he faces off against Neo and he goes, I will enjoy watching you die, Mr. Anderson. I'm gonna enjoy watching you die. It's like that energy that Hugo Weaving gives off. I took a bit of inspiration from that. And ultimately, of course, I also did my own thing with it. But, you know, I also have certain reference points to help me get into character or get into the voice and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I just love playing villains. They're so much fun. You really get to savor certain moments and really chew on scenes, especially in JoJo. But with Poochie, he's so layered. You got that tragic episode in episode 31 where you get his backstory. And there I had to play someone who, you know, has a lot of good in him and had every good intention. But fate and life circumstances just coincidentally culminated into some of the most tragic happenstances for Pucci, which is how he became who he is in the present day, this kind of like delusional uh, villain who I think is driven so much by grief, is how I interpret it. In his backstory episode, uh, we learned that, I mean, he contributed to the death of his sister. You know, he had the best of intentions, but sometimes the road to hell is paved in good intentions. And it happened to be that his fraternal twin, uh, Domenico Pucci, who becomes Wes, or Weather Report, uh, he happened to be taken and stolen as a baby because his other mother had lost her child uh, during birth and in her grief decided to take this baby and raise, her, raise him as her own. And then eventually Wes happened to date Pucci's sister, but they didn't know that they were biological siblings. And Pucci learns about this in a confessional when the mother confesses to Pucci that she committed the sin, but Pucci, because he's bound 
by, you know, the code of a priest, essentially, by his devotion to God, he can't say anything. So he's trapped between a rock and a hard place, and he figures, I'm just going to hire someone to break them up. But they turn out to be these really evil goons who hang west because they discover he's associated with a black family. And so the sister, believing him to be dead, decides, I have no reason to live anymore. I won't, my heart is broken. I won't feel emotions again, essentially, and just kind of jumps off a cliff. Turned out Wes was alive, and when he comes to and realizes what happened to his love, he, like, goes crazy, and he just decides he hates the world and hates everything and wants to kill Pucci at all costs. It's such insane levels of coincidences that led to such insane levels of tragedies that it just broke Pucci. It drove him mad with grief. Damn it all! Please don't let this be the end! Don't take her life away! None of this was Perla's fault! All she did was fall in love! I will do anything that you ask of me! Just please bring her back! If anyone should be damned for this sin, it's me! Hey! And instead of seeking help, seeking a way to heal and move on from this, he decides to cope by seeking answers to the universe, to fate, and why all this happens. And in his vulnerable state, Dio sort of radicalizes him, and he becomes a bit of an extremist, a bit of a, you know, wipe the slate clean kind of person, and find a way to ensure that nobody goes through what I went through. You know, my intentions are honorable and good. His goal is to ensure that fate never has that level of influence over people ever again. And it's worth sacrificing people. It's worth terrorizing the people of this universe because we're going to reset all this anyway. And the people who make it to the new universe, his thought process is if people are aware of fate and their own fate, then they can accept it and move on and just kind of live peacefully knowing what's going to happen next. And he believes this is paradise. This is true happiness. Except the way I interpret it is that he's someone who's lost the capability to feel happy. He's so embroiled by grief. So he's almost like the last person you want to ask about what it is to be truly happy. He's sort of the manifestation of hurt people, hurt people. And his inability to accept his own fate is what leads him down this path of absolutes. Of this universe has to go so I can make a new universe where people will have precognition. And just this whole idea of, you know, you're trapped under this force known as fate, but hey, at least you'll know you're trapped under this force of fate and you'll know what your fate is. And that is true happiness. But the motif of Stone Ocean is that of a prison, right? And I think the reason they picked the prison as a setting is because that symbolism for fate itself, which you know, when you think about it, it's like it's a prison of its own, where it's like you're trapped in this cycle that's fated to happen, especially the Joe Stars and the Brandos, they're, you know, meant to be locked in conflict, you know, for, for ad infinitum, essentially. And so the motif is, you know, how do we break out of that, right? Breaking out of prison, breaking out of fate. And Pucci's logic, when you think about it, is, well, if you accept that you're living in this prison, and you know that you're going to live in this prison, and you know what's going to happen in this prison that you're trapped in, where you can't change your fate at all, then you'll be happy. It's like when you put it that way, you realize, man, that's, no, uh, that, that does not sound like happiness at all. That does not sound like freedom. That sounds a bit hellish. And so, yeah, like Pucci is very much, uh, he genuinely believes he's doing good. He genuinely believes this is the way he'll save humanity from the despair that he went through. But he's so far gone because that grief has corrupted his mind so much that he's just kind of blinded himself to everything but this copium that he's kind of injecting into his veins by seeking the answers to the universe, by trying to understand fate and trying to manipulate fate and trying to expose fate to the masses, believing that, you know, that's how we achieve happiness. But then Pucci's inability to accept fate itself and how those events are meant to be played out is what got him killed. You know, when he tried to kill Emporio before his time was meant to be up, and so fate ended up ultimately betraying him. Like, he's such a compelling, layered, tragic, just really fascinating character that I got to really explore. I, I really think he is my favorite JoJo villain, not just because I got to play him, but because there's so many complexities surrounding him. Uh, again, just what a freaking honor to, to be a part of JoJo and to be able to bring this character to life. And I still have to pinch myself that I got to do this, that I got to see it through all the way to the end, and that uh, this character will be immortalized for English dub watchers through my performance. And 
I just really hope you guys enjoyed it. And, you know, I seeing all the positive feedback you guys have been giving me, I just really felt uh, both a sense of fulfillment, but also a sense of relief and just a sense of satisfaction and a sense of my job is done. And I had so much fun doing it, too. So it's just been positive vibes all around. I do want to thank a couple people before I wrap up this video. Right here we have a photo of the one and only Mami Okada, who is the casting director at Bang Zoom, who records dubs for a bunch of animes, among other types of works. And uh, she gave me my first ever gig in Los Angeles when I got here. I got cast in Welcome to Demon School Iruma-kun. That was the first gig I ever did in L.A. And then months later, she would and trust me with this seminal role in Rico Pucci. I submitted my audition, and fortunately, she liked what I gave her. But, you know, when you're handed a role this big, part of it is, you know, that sense of, you know, I trust this actor to be professional and to do the work and to be able to deliver what needs to be delivered. And the fact that she plays that trust in me means a lot. And uh, just, Mommy, you've made so many of my dreams come true. I will forever be indebted to you. Um, just thank you for everything, really. I took this behind the scenes at Anime Expo where we had this JoJo panel. It was this huge crowd. It was amazing, man. The enthusiasm of JoJo fans is just something else. I got some photos here for those who are interested. So this is me just taking a picture alongside my boy in the final session. This was after the screams and the, you know, the death scene and all these things uh, after the session was over. I just had to find a way to memorialize this occasion, and so I took this picture. And lo and behold, the session after was for the actor who played the character that kills me, Casey Mongillo, here who plays uh, Emporio, happened to walk in. We took a picture to together in front of the monitor with the two characters facing off against each other. Just an awesome, awesome individual. And of course, we had to take a picture with our director here, Courtney Sanford, who gave us so much creative freedom with our performances. And he, you know, when we felt like, I don't know, I could do one more take that's a little better, he'd always give us that chance or he'd always take input from us and consider that and see if we could adjust the performance uh, because I, I really wanted to get this character right and Courtney really understood that and so he really gave us a lot of uh, creative freedom and flexibility to shape the performance and for that I'm truly grateful. I also have to give a big shout out to all of our audio engineers here. I mean, without the myriad audio engineers who are involved in JoJo Stone Ocean, we just wouldn't have been able to do this through the pandemic and we just wouldn't sound as good and you know, there are times when, um, you know, we do a take for a line and it's like a little too short or a little too long, but they find a way to just engineer that in such a way where they make it fit and uh, they just make our lives so much easier. So uh, just all the audio engineers who worked on JoJo, you guys are awesome. Sometime after the launch of the third batch of Stone Ocean, the cast decided to do a little watch party and just kind of celebrate the finale of Stone Ocean and the finale of this JoJo universe, this JoJo series together. And, I mean, we got most of the cast here. We didn't get Brittany, who, you know, she had to be in Texas. But, I mean, she did incredible as FF. Matt Mercer couldn't make it to his watch party, though. He did make it to the first one. And, I mean, his performance as Jotra, obviously, you know, is uh, pretty iconic in the JoJo series. Yeah, I mean, I, I really just want to give a big shout-out to the cast members here. Kira Buckland as Jolene, you know, really capture the character's strengths and vulnerabilities, but also that growth and development that Jolene goes through. I think she did just a fantastic job. And many of you know, but for Kira specifically, playing Jolene was like a dream role for her, and she's been gunning for this for years. And the fact that she got to do it and got to do just such an awesome job is just really wholesome and... uh it's just really, really cool. Tiana Camacho as Hermes. I mean, brought out the badass side of Hermes. But also she has a really dark past too. And she brought out a lot of emotions from her. And it was just excellent. And what a lot of cast members love about Hermes is that the character, the way Tiana portrays her, is just so just Tiana. It's just her. And so the performance just feels really natural. Like it's just a, an actual person that exists because it is an actual person that exists. Brittany Lauda brought to life FF and she did a phenomenal job. So FF is this really quirky character, but also there's a lot of heart to them because, I mean, there's someone who are looking for their humanity. FF is essentially a collection of plankton that takes over a human body and they're trying to fit in. And so it was just really wholesome how that was represented. You can't help but love FF and their relationship with Jolene. It was just a, a really cool dynamic. Emporio has both got that innocence, but also also has a pretty sad backstory. And so there's a lot of melancholy that comes through this character, but is sort of the heart of the story at the end of it all. And Casey just brings so much heart to it. I mean... Uh, Emporia made me shed a few tears watching through the dub. And as a fun fact, Kira and Casey are roommates, and 
you can really feel just how close these two characters are through the closeness of these two actors and you know their interactions and those final moments uh just really both heart-wrenching and then at the very end really heartwarming stephen Fu is weather report my brother in the anime and uh you know we obviously our characters have a very complicated history stephen not only manages to bring out the coolness of weather report and wes but also that seeding hatred that he has towards poochie and just the i'm done with all this uh, this thing called life because of everything that transpired. And it was just really fun watching our two characters face off against each other. He just really killed it as weather report. Howard Wang as Narciso Anasui or as Anastasia. Uh, I mean, just brings out that sultry sexiness from the character while simping so hard for Jolene. Just captures the simping so well, but also brings a lot of heart to what is ultimately, you know, genuine love that he has for Jolene and there's a sincere loyalty that Anastasia has for Jolene and eventually this whole crew and uh, Howard I think really portrays that super well and I just love all of the what the fuck is going on here kind of moments that uh, Anastasia has throughout the show he just uh, really brings the the perfect energy to this character. And of course, Matthew Mercer is Joe Trocujo. He's been playing this character for so many years now. It was so cool for the character to get one final send-off. My character does kill Jotro, so sorry about that, Matt. And with this Jojo part, because we got Jotro's daughter involved, Matt does a great job of bringing some vulnerability to Jotro. You know, usually Jotro is just too cool for this world kind of guy. He's just the most badass of badasses, uh, just untouchable, right? But in Stone Ocean, he is vulnerable, and Poochie exploits that vulnerability to ultimately end his life. And you got so many other cast members involved who did an absolutely stellar job at helping bring this season to life, so... I'm just really deeply honored and grateful that I got to be a part of this and that, that I got to work with uh, such awesome and talented and just uh, really fun and genuinely good uh, human beings and actors. You know, these characters, these worlds really don't come to life until they live in the hearts and minds of fans like yourself, the JoJo fans who've been just so supportive of the series and so supportive of the cast and just been really encouraging and... Uh, have said all these kind words and have expressed against just such enthusiasm towards this really epic finale. Um, so, man, I keep saying it, but I'll have to keep saying it. What a dream come true this is. And just, uh, it's just cool that I get to do this. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see where the future takes us from here. Uh, hopefully we'll get more JoJo. You know, hopefully part seven will be animated at some point and beyond. But, um, you know, I'm really happy with how things wrapped up. And I'm just honored that I got to be a part of the series, especially at its peak finale. And uh, Enrico Pucci, uh, he's going to be just one of the most memorable parts of my life forever and ever. And uh, yeah, just uh, what a gift from both uh, the production side of things and from the really just enthusiastic fans. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to end this video. I hope this provided some fun insight into what it was like to just finish off this character and Stone Ocean. I'll do occasional updates as far as voiceover goes in the future, but of course, mostly this is going to be a gaming news channel. Um, but just, yeah, I just really felt like I needed to say thanks and give kudos to a bunch of folks. But that's that. To be further updated on all things gaming news, reviews, and discussions, and occasional voiceover updates, stay tuned right here on Young Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Young out.